right to it. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 as we're going through this epistle chapter by chapter and verse by verse and we're going to finish chapter 10 today and we'll pick it up in verse 13 and our text will be verses 13 through 18. So if you're not already there you can turn there and once you do if you would stand you can follow along with me as I read. If not that's okay where you're sitting, you can still follow along. We'll begin again in verse 13, where the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is writing and says, We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand, so that, verse 16, we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, for we do not want to boast about work already done in someone else's territory, or as some of your translations render it, on another man's foundation. But, verse 17, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Let's pray if you would join with me. We'll ask God's blessing on our understanding. Loving Heavenly Father, will you at this time settle us and calm us down and enable us by the Holy Spirit to focus on that which you have for us today? Lord, we want to give you our undivided attention. We don't want any distraction that would keep us from that which you would desire to speak to us in your word today. So Lord, as you speak, we want to have ears to hear and hearts to receive. So Lord, please speak, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So today's teaching is going to be part three of a series I've titled Defending False Accusations. We're going to finish chapter 10 today and in so doing we'll once again see by way of the example of the Apostle Paul how it is that we're to respond to those antagonists who attack us, gossip about us, and even falsely accuse us. The Apostle Paul finds himself needing to defend himself against those in the Corinthian church who were viciously, and I mean (laughs) viciously, attacking him with the purpose of discrediting him. We saw our first way to respond in verses 1 and 2, and it's that of being humble and bold. These are not mutually exclusive in the sense that they are paradoxical. There can be this humility that comes packaged with a sanctified boldness, as one called it, a holy boldness. And this is true of the Apostle Paul, where here he appeals to them by Christ's humility and gentleness, basically saying that the last thing he wants to do is to be blunt and bold with them, those who were accusing him, but he's finding himself being in this unenviable position of being forced to. And this is, in a way, why it is that the Apostle Paul's tone has completely changed from chapter 10 on through the rest of the book. Up to chapter 9, he takes a very gracious tone. There's still a a sanctified sarcasm, as one called it. 
But when he gets to chapter 10, in fact, he is so harsh in his tone with them that some have suggested that chapters 10 through 13 are an entirely different letter altogether. I'm not personally of that belief, but I can see how some would believe that and suggest that. The bottom line is Paul has to be very firm, very blunt, very bold, yet very humble. The second way to respond when falsely accused is to fight with spiritual weapons and not worldly weapons, not carnal weapons. Paul says our, our weapons are not carnal in nature. This is a spiritual battle that we're fighting. And Paul tells them that not only are these weapons not carnal, but spiritual in nature, but these weapons have divine power that is so powerful that it can demolish strongholds and cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. But there's a prerequisite to this. And the prerequisite to this is that we have to take every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. Is it compatible with the words of Christ, the word of God? If it's not, it has no place. And it should never be allowed to take up residence in the thought life of a Christian. And that's where the battleground is. It's in the mind. Well, the third one is in verses 7 through 10, and it's that of building up instead of tearing down. This is what Paul does here. He doesn't lower himself to their level. He rebukes them for judging by outward appearances after they had attacked him with the purpose of tearing him down. We're going to talk about this more towards the end of the chapter. The fourth one is in verses 11 and 12, and it's that of not comparing ourselves with others. Here, again, Paul refuses to stoop to their level, becoming like them, like the proverb says, chapter 26, do not answer a fool according to their folly, lest you become like them. You are to answer a fool according to their folly, lest they become wise in their own eyes. In other words, when you answer a fool, don't lower yourself to their level, lest you become like them. Conversely, you answer a fool according to their folly, which is what Paul is doing here in their folly. He's answering them, rebuking them, lest they become wise in their own eyes. And I find it interesting that he says that those who commend themselves with themselves is not wise. <laughs> in other words, it's foolish to do that. Well, this brings us to our text today where we find our fifth way. And it's that of understanding our God-given authority. In verse 13, Paul tells them he won't boast beyond measure, but will limit it to what God has appointed to him, which also includes the Corinthian church as well. And in verse 14, he says he's not going too far in boasting, as would be the case if he hadn't come to them, which Paul had done in order to reach them with the gospel and preach to them the gospel. What is Paul saying here? What Paul is saying here is that he stayed within the limits of God's calling on his life such that he didn't cross the line, go beyond that which God had called him to do. He didn't go into or cross the line over into someone's area of calling. I like how one commentator explained it. The idea of the limits of the sphere comes from the lanes that were allotted for runners in a race. The Corinthians would recognize this because they loved races and held the famous Isthmian games in Corinth. Paul is saying, I'm running in my own lane and not in someone else's. All godly authority 
has a sphere. It's a God-given authority. It is important for the person in authority to not exercise that authority outside the sphere. And it is important for the person under authority to recognize the sphere of authority that they are under. And this is precisely why Paul says what he says. It's important to understand that there were some there in the Corinthian church that were trying to delegitimize Paul's apostolic authority. That was the whole purpose behind what they were doing in their false accusations of him, their vicious attacks against him. And again, this is why it is that Paul is taking such a firm posture and a harsh tone. I find it rather ironic that these Christians in the Corinthian church were actually guilty of the very thing that they were accusing the Apostle Paul of. And I'll explain why I say that. And again, it's textbook in the sense that this is what antagonists do. We know to be true that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. What if I told you that the devil can fill the heart of a Christian to become the agent for said accusation against the brethren? It happens all the time. Paul writing in his second epistle to Timothy says that Satan can fill the hearts and he prays that they'll come to their senses so that they cannot be used any longer of the devil to bring discord and division into the church. When I say textbook, what I mean is, is that those who falsely accuse you will do so by questioning your authority. The reason they will question your authority is because they will never submit to your authority. And such was the case with the Apostle Paul. And as we're going to see next, he discerns and even exposes their sinful and selfish motive. And this is what I want to spend the rest of our time together talking about today in 2 Corinthians. In verses 15 through 18, what Paul does is he spiritually discerns the underlying motivation of his detractors. In verse 15, he tells them that he didn't go beyond his limits by boasting in and taking credit for what others did. And here's why. His hope was that their faith would continue to grow. And in verse 16, he goes on to explain, saying, it was so they could preach the gospel in regions beyond Corinth so as to not build on another man's foundation. And then in verses 17 and 18, he says, let those who boast do so in the Lord, for it's not the one who commends himself that's approved, it's the Lord who both commends and approves. Okay. The Apostle Paul is putting his finger on what I would argue is the most dangerous and destructive dynamic within the church today. Namely, that of what motivates carnal and antagonistic Christians to wield their self-perceived authority knowing, knowing full well, that it could result in splitting a church. If there was anyone who could speak to this, it was the Apostle Paul. And this because of his own experience with what's come to be known as wolves in sheep's clothing. Join me in Acts chapter 20. I want to read verses 28 through 31. Luke is writing and the Apostle Paul is exhorting and he says, verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, listen, that after my departure 
Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, from within, men will rise up speaking perverse things, and here's why. They want to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years, get this, this is the Apostle Paul we're talking about, for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Did you catch that? The Apostle Paul cried a lot. That brings me great comfort to know that someone as strong as the Apostle Paul would cry. Crying. You know, we're told as boys, you know, big boys don't cry. And so what do we do? We stuff it all of our lives. And then some of us make up for it <laughs> towards the end of our lives. And we cry about everything. I do. I cry over a menu sometimes. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> Especially when it's prime rib. I'm very moved by that. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> Can you imagine that the Apostle Paul, for three years, day and night, wept over the knowledge that after he left, there would come from within them these wolves that would not spare the flock in their destruction of the church. Make no mistake about it. God loves you, but Satan hates you. Satan hates the church. Satan really hates this church. <laughs> it's not your fault. You have an Arab pastor that loves Israel. Satan hates your guts, I'm telling you. And he hates my guts too. And Satan will seek to destroy the church of Jesus Christ, and this is how he does it. This is how he does it. He does it from within. It's textbook, divide and conquer. Listen to what Adam Clark said of this in his commentary. It is base, abominable, and deeply sinful for a man to thrust himself into another man's labors and by sowing doubtful disputations among a Christian people, distract and divide them that he may get a party to himself. That's the motive. That's the sinful, selfish motive, is to draw disciples unto oneself. Clark goes on to say, this is an evil that has prevailed much in all ages of the church. There is at present much of it in the Christian world, and Christianity is disgraced by it. I think you would agree that this is why God hates the sowing of discord amongst the brethren. Proverbs chapter 6, I want to read verses 12 through 19. And I want you to listen very carefully to what Solomon writes here. A worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. He winks his eyes. He shuffles his feet. He points with his fingers. Perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually. He sows discord. Therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. Suddenly, he shall be broken without remedy. And then verse 16 says this. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. In other words, the seventh on this list not only does God hate it, it's an abomination. What is it? Well, let's see. Verse 17, a proud look, 
one. A lying tongue, two. Hands that shed innocent blood, three. A heart that devises wicked plans, four. Feet that are swift in running to evil, five. A false witness who speaks lies, six. And number seven, the abomination is one who sows discord among brethren. James has been likened to the New Testament book of Proverbs, and I love James. And you got to love James. You know why you got to love James? Because he was the half-brother of the Savior, Jesus himself. Can you imagine? Born after Jesus to Joseph and Mary, grew up with God incarnate in his family. How would you like to be compared to your brother if that's the case, right? James, why can't you be more like Jesus? Look at he cleans his room. It's always perfect. To which James, I'm sure, responded, Well, of course, he's God. <laughs> he's got my brother is God, my half-brother. So when you read his epistle, you kind of get the idea that he doesn't pull any punches. I mean, if you grew up with the Savior of mankind as your half-brother in your home, you would kind of have a little bit of an edge to you, too. And this is what I love about James, and he just gets right to the point, head on, in chapter 4, and he explains where quarrels, where division, where fighting, infighting, backbiting comes from. Listen to what he says. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive. Why? Because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. And then he says this very in your face adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I'm going to make a statement here, and I want you to really think it through as I say it. At the core, at the center of every conflict, every argument, every fight, all discord, at the core of all of it is pride. That's at the center. And you know what's at the center of pride? The letter I. It's also in the center of sin. And I would venture to say that pride is at the center of all sin. Certainly it was with the first sin. Not in the garden, but in heaven when Lucifer said repeatedly, I will ascend my throne above the Most High. I, 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 yay, 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 yay. I is at the center of all sin. I, the center of pride. I, the center of everything. I seeks to pleasure self. I seeks to have everything center around self. This notion of dying to self, foreign, unknown, never done. I'm hoping you'll kindly indulge me in closing as I share from my own personal experience 
how painful this can be to a church. I've seen it. I've survived it. (laughs) And I've lived to tell about it. And sadly, on more than one occasion. I've been on the receiving end of false accusations from those with an agenda hoping to draw disciples to themselves. And I've also seen firsthand what the proverb says about the destruction that comes suddenly upon those who do. I've shared it before. Perhaps this is a, an appropriate time to share it again, but the church that I had planted and pastored on the mainland was split by my associate pastor who I had hired and brought on staff. And it was really interesting to kind of watch it from the sidelines because I had no idea. I was so naive. And I watched how he worked the crowd. Unbeknownst to me, it was textbook in that he was trying to draw disciples unto himself, unto himself with the intent of taking and split. First of all, he wanted to take that church. But I didn't have permission to give the church to him, that which God had called me to do, to pastor. So he split the church, took half the church, went down the street and started another church. And it was devastating. Some of you have come from a bad church experience. Perhaps you're sitting here today and you've been hurt by a pastor. Well, it goes both ways. I've been hurt as a pastor and I've seen how it affects the church. I see how it affects the families in the church. I see how it affects marriages in the church. Some of the people that were involved in it are no longer married. Some of them not even walking with the Lord anymore. And it's so sad because their kids want nothing to do with the church. They want nothing to do with the things of God. They will never step foot in a church because they saw what happened. And they witnessed it firsthand. I actually told the church that when I was in business, when I owned my own business and I was in the corporate world, I had been treated better (laughs) by non-Christians than how I'm seeing Christians treat one another. The gossiping, the backbiting, the division, the discord. And I I know why. Understand our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness. Perhaps you have experienced this, and you're here in this church, and praise the Lord for that. I, I hope you feel safe in this church. And, oh, by the way, in the 12 years, Since I planted this church, and I've had the privilege of being the pastor of this church, we have never had a church split, and I pray we never do. God has had his hand of protection over this fellowship, over this body of believers. I I learned the hard way. I learned a lot from my very first church plant, And there's things that I've done in the pastoring of this church that I think have lent itself to protecting this body of believers from this horrific thing we call a church split. But you have your part in it too. And it's as if the Apostle Paul is writing to us here today and exhorting us, even rebuking us, saying to us, be very careful. Be very careful. As an overseer, as a pastor, 
I am entrusted with the oversight of this flock of God. And that is a tremendous responsibility. It is a privilege for sure, but it is a tremendous responsibility. I want to close with one final thought. Many years ago, someone went to Pastor Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and said to him, Pastor Chuck, I want you to know that my family and I are here in this church because we're safe here. And they had come out of a horrific, unthinkable church split that just destroyed people. Oh, and oh, by the way, I'm not boasting in this. I'm not glorying in this. I'm not happy about this. But the pastor who split my church and went down the street to start another church had an affair and committed adultery with a woman in that church. And you know what's really interesting? I had a brother give me a word of knowledge, and he said, if this man will split your church and do that to your church, he'll do that to his wife. And he did. He did. And by the way, parenthetically, let me say that that's what a church split does. You know why God hates divorce? Because of what divorce does to the divorced, especially the children. When you have a husband and a wife, a mother and a father split, they're finding now in the studies that especially the older the child is, the more devastating it is. I remember having people in the church say to me, I'm so torn. I want to go with them, but because all my friends are going there now, but I love you and you're my pastor. I don't know what to do. And it's so devastating. It's like what divorce does to children. And that's why God hates it. And that's why God hates the sowing of discord so much that it's an abomination because of what it does to God's people, the family of God, the children of God. My commitment to you as the pastor of this amazing, amazing church, I always tell people, if I wasn't the pastor of this church, I would attend this church. Man, you got comfortable chairs now. I'll be here. And the food is great, by the way, <laughs> afterwards. No, I would come to this church. I love this church. If I wasn't the pastor of this church, this would be my church. I think it's pretty good when a pastor can say that the church he pastors would be the church he would attend if he wasn't the pastor of the church. That says a lot about you, doesn't it? You know when we're told that by our love one for another, the world will know that we're his disciples. Have you ever tried to flip that around the other way? If the world knows we're his disciples by our love one for another, will they question whether or not we're his disciples if we're backbiting one another? In other words, Satan knows. <laughs> he knows the scriptures better than we do. And he knows that if the world will identify us as disciples of Jesus Christ by our love one for another, then if he can somehow get in and involve himself in that church to sow discord within that church so that instead of loving one another, everybody is fighting with one another, then he's got it. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in our prophecy update, which we'll get to now. But it's been said that if Satan can't beat the church, and certainly the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church, if he can't beat the church, he'll join the church. He'll join the church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you. A hard word, but very needed. Lord, I cannot thank you enough for how you've protected this flock, 
this church and made it a safe place for your people to come and assemble together in your name. Lord, I pray that you'll protect this church from wolves who would come in and not spare the flock. Lord, I pray that you would protect this church from division and discord. Protect this church from the gossip that can be so destructive and dangerous. Lord, I pray that the enemy would never be given a foothold or a stronghold within this body of believers. And Lord, thank you for this church and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.